John, what was, or who was, the first musician that you can remember seeing when you were growing up whose clothes on stage really impressed you? Uh, I think the first, first person I ever saw that uh, really sort of hit me clothes-wise was Gene Vincent. Um, with his leather suits. You know, I always wanted a leather suit after that. And uh, by the time I could actually afford one, our manager made us dress like little mods, so I never actually got to wear it. What were, uh, what were teenagers wearing when you were growing up? <coughs> uh, when I was a kid, it was uh, little short bum freezer jackets. Uh, collars with clips in, pointed toed shoes, which I'm still wearing, <laughs> um, cutaway collars, Italian suits. When, uh, when, you, were, when you were growing up in Beach, were you were in a band, were, were clothes important to you then? Yeah, before I was in the band, I, you know, I, I tried to be the probably the most outlandish dressed kid at school. I was the only kid at my school that had a a light blue jacket instead of a navy blue jacket um, in the uniform and my my school badge was stuck on with a paper clip so that I could take it off you know, when I left school. Uh, I was wearing tight light grey trousers instead of dark grey trousers and brown pointed toed shoes instead of black casuals which we were supposed to wear so I got sent away from school a couple of times for wearing the wrong uniform but I still actually came back wearing the same stuff. It's amazing that you got away with that given how rigid English school systems were that they, they allowed that at all. I think I got away with it by avoiding the teachers you know I sort of take all the different corridors and sort of try and stay away from actually being noticed by a teacher. It worked. How did, when did, when did the Teddy Boys come about? Teddy Boys were a bit before my time. Um, I kind of got in on the tail end of it. Um, Roger was wearing drape jackets, you know, but when I, when I actually started getting interested in clothes it was more um more italian suits and the stuff i've been explaining what was um when the who were managed by peter meaden how what was the dress like then well peter meaden took us out to a sports store and bought us all uh ice skating jackets and boxing boots and uh, Levi jeans with half inch turn ups. And I remember we all got taken to a barber's and queued up and had our hair cut off. And Roger was given a nice seersucker jacket and, you know, sort of decent clothes to wear and like white Italian shoes with black, like a black surround. And I, I wanted to wear those clothes instead of the stupid skating jackets. So, uh, the first puddle I walked through with the boxing boots, the soles fell off. Anyway, so we finally changed, so we all wore seersucker jackets and decent clothes. How, um, how important at, at that stage of, of, your, of your musical career, how important were clothes to you as a performer? I, th I think I the <coughs> 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 the clothes were important uh, performing wise because you had to feel good on stage you know you had to, you had to feel uh, in some way superior to the audience I think that the mod thing that we went through we felt like one of the audience which which uh, wasn't very good for our egos um, well especially mine but I think once once we actually got into uh, the pop art clothes then I, I I think we, we started uh, 
feeling right about the way we were dressed. You know, we felt that we were ahead of the audience in dress, which was which is a good feeling. How did the how did the mod think about how did the mod the mod dressing come about for you? I don't know about the mod stuff. I mean, we we were kind of uh, fake. You know, we were a manufactured mod band, uh, so we didn't really actually get into get into the clothes, we just copied what our audience was wearing. Um, with, uh, with the clothes that followed afterwards, we actually made the clothes up for ourselves, but I mean, it, we didn't really know that much about mod culture. You know, the, we spent so much time on stage playing for them, we didn't actually sort of get into sort of what they were about. Uh, Pete, Peter Meaden really manufactured us as a, a mod band. You know, um, it was kind of forced on us that, that that would be the best thing to actually sort of get us a hit, uh, which it didn't. I mean, we had to, <laughs> we actually had to get out of the mod thing to actually get our first hit record. When uh, Lambert and Stamps became involved, did they dictate how you would dress? Um, I think, I don't think, uh, Chris, Chris Stamp actually ever dictated anything. <laughs> um, he usually just went along with Kit and supplied the finances. Um, Kit Lambert, um, had the idea of, of, that, that we should wear clothes that the audience didn't have, you know, and, uh, we came up with the idea of the Union Jack jackets first, and then I took it a little bit further and had a, a royal flag jacket made and a, um, a Scottish flag jacket and different waistcoats and different things. But I mean, it was it was basically uh, taking our part and, and turning them into clothes. How long after you started doing that did you notice that the audience was catching up with you? Yeah, I think the audience caught up when one day we saw about five guys in the audience wearing Union Jack jackets and we figured it was probably time to, uh, to move on. Um, and the, the sort of mid-60s Regency uh, mode of dressing, you know, the, with the soldiers' tunics and stuff like that was actually catching on, so uh, we kind of moved over to that. to America in the mid-60s. What did you, do you remember anything about how the, the kids were dressing there as opposed to dressing in England? When we first went to America, I don't think, that, that I think the nose, the, the clothes, the nose, where did I get that from? <laughs> <laughs> and when we first got to America, um, they all looked like Beach Boy fans, really. I mean, they, they, the clothes were very nondescript. Uh, you know, I can't actually think of anything to remember them by. All I remember is uh, long uncut fringes and big bushy ginger moustaches. Everybody seemed to have a ginger moustache in those days. <laughs> in America, um, not only the Who's music, but also your stage appearance was always considered, especially in, in the earlier years, considered very flamboyant and outrageous. Did you guys consider yourself flamboyant and outrageous? I suppose we were flamboyant and outrageous. Uh, I know that in the beginning, uh, when we were going through all these clothes changes, we were very arrogant about the way we looked and the way we sounded. We thought that we dressed differently from everybody and we played differently from everybody um, and we actually had the guts to, to wear our stage clothes out in the street as well in those days which is like sort of real peculiar especially in America in the in the early 60s when uh, we'd, we'd end up staying in transport caffs that were next to truck driver stops and we'd be wearing these stupid clothes and, and feeling very insecure <laughs> I would say that you were very brave to have done that. Was um was it a a, a group 
decision, John, as to what to wear, or did everybody, did you get to be very individual as, as to what you were wearing on stage? We never really had any group decisions. I mean, it was a, we'd, we'd have meetings, like sort of discussing what we were going to wear next, maybe, you know, and uh, I suppose as far as the group decision was concerned, if you wore something that made the rest of the band laugh, then you didn't wear it anymore. Um, but I, I kind of drifted back to the clothes that I, that I wanted to wear. You know, I sort of kind of got stuck in a style that, that I never actually sort of came out of. You know, I've been wearing the same boots uh, for, what, 15 years now. Um, and I like them, so I wear them. Take a second and just sort of describe your personal style for me. My style. Hmm. It's very difficult. Yeah. I mean, I I like these boots. So I like waistcoats. Um, I hate going anywhere in just a shirt. I like to wear a jacket. Uh, a lot of the time, I wear three-piece suits. Um, I like leather, tight trousers. I don't think I ever owned more than one pair of baggy trousers when they were actually in vogue. I, I hated the things. Um, I, I kind of find some, you know, I find a, 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 a boot that I like, a pair of jeans that I like, a waistcoat I like, and a shirt that I like, and I st stick to it for as long as I can. You know. The only thing that ever changes with me is, you know, I go from flare to straight trousers, and then when flares come back in, I'll put them back on. You know. I've got a hundred pairs upstairs. Yeah, the boots come from a place called Anello and David, which is the original shop that uh, that made the Beetle boots when they first came out. Um, all they really are, are, are Spanish flamenco dancer boots without the studs. They just make theatrical boots, you know, clown boots and ballet shoes and flamenco dancer shoes. We were talking, and what was the most outrageous thing you ever remember wearing on stage? The most outrageous thing I ever wore was uh, probably a black uh, jumpsuit with a skeleton on that uh, I wore at the Isle of Wight Festival. Uh, I went to... Uh, I went to the Playboy Club in Miami once and they wouldn't let me in without a jacket. So I went downstairs to the clothes shop there and uh, bought myself a, an outsized yellow tartan or the plaid jacket uh, that was five sizes too big. And I wore that a couple of times on stage and that looked ridiculous. It was like a clown jacket, you know, shoulders out to here. So that was the silliest thing I've ever worn. Do you remember any one performance looking over one night and being totally shocked by something that either Peter or Roger had on? I was shocked by what Pete and Roger wore every night, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Pete, Pete kind of uh, revolted against clothes for a while and used to wear these boiler suits, white boiler suits. And uh, one night we were staying at the same hotel as John Sebastian. And John Sebastian had this habit of stealing people's clothes and, and bringing them back tie-dyed, different colours, yeah. And uh, he managed to get to Pete's boiler suits and dyed them like rainbow colours. I think the first time I actually saw that on stage, I nearly fell over. That was absolutely ridiculous. I'm certain so did Pete. <laughs> <laughs> what a great story. What about... Uh, what, what about about your hair over the years? Did you, were you always influenced by, as far as hair links, by what other people were doing, or was that important to you? Uh, I've always hated my hair. Um, you know, I sort of, it, my forehead has always been this high, right? And I st when I st started off trying to grow a, a beetle haircut, it took me three years longer than anyone else. And by the time I'd grown it, everyone had their hair cut again. So. <laughs> 
I, you know, I've got very, very fine hair that flies all over the place and I've, I've hated it for years. I dyed it black for 14 years uh, and then realised that I preferred the colour that was underneath, which was salt and pepper. Um, I, just, I just gave up in the end. I just comb it back. Yeah, just let it go where it wants to go. What, um, when the, in the, in the earlier years, were you, were you at all influenced by what the Beatles and the Stones were wearing at all? I was, I was influenced by the way the Stones dress more than the Beatles. Um, I mean, we bought the, the usual Beatle jackets and the round collars, uh, but that was kind of their, their style. Um, with the stones, with the leather waistcoats and trousers, I mean, that, that kind of period, I, I think I preferred the way they dressed than, than the way the Beatles dressed. The Beatles always looked too tidy, too nice, you know. And we were a rhythm and blues band, so it didn't really sort of suit us to wear stuff like that. We'd, in the early days, we had these nice little uh, red lapel-less suits that looked absolutely atrocious. We wore that for a little while. That was when we were a, a pop band, you know, that was uh, playing everyone else's hits in pubs. I just thought of you guys in red lapel-less suits. <laughs> We were talking a little bit earlier, and, and you were talking about the fact that uh, in the early years you, you, you guys were an R&B band, and you obviously had heavy R&B influence. Um, were there any of the the R and B American R and B bands or black musicians that you ever thought of as being particularly well dressed? R and B black musicians well dressed. Um. Really, I suppose the only well dressed. God. So, do you think of any? Did any come to mind? American black R and B bands, well dressed. Um, well, you couldn't really say that Howlin' Wolf was well dressed. Or Sonny Boy Williamson. Um, probably the best dressed one was Buddy Guy, I should think. It's the only one I've actually seen photographed in a suit. Uh, they all wore those funny little trilby hats, didn't they? No, I can't really say I can. So, uh, what about Elvis? Were you ever impressed with anything that Elvis was wearing? Elvis Presley, I, I, I wasn't really a fan of his until, until I was about 35, you know. Um, I certainly hated the way he dressed. I mean, I loved the, the, the gold lame suit, but the, uh, the Las Vegas uh, rhinestones kind of left me cold. Uh, very peculiar. How important do you think that style and fashion are to rock and roll? Can you separate them, do you think, today? You can't really separate fashion and, and, uh, and rock music. It's, it's got to go hand in hand. The, the people on stage have got to, uh, in some way, either emulate or influence their audience in, in dress, um, either by wearing something absolutely ridiculous that the audience wouldn't dream of wearing, so they can, the audience actually think of going to see the the performer on stage wearing something silly, or to actually, uh, as Springsteen does, make the audience feel like they're like just like you, like one of the band, because they're wearing the same stuff. You know, they go, they wear the same hair grease and uh, use the same toothpaste. I mean, it's, there's there's two different ways of looking at it. You've got Duran Duran on one side, uh, wearing extremely expensive clothes and, and gallons of makeup and Bruce Springsteen wearing a, a one dollar t-shirt and a pair of Levi's, you know. You, just, you brought up an interesting point and that is, that is Duran Duran. Um, how, and, and they certainly are a product of music television 
and they certainly are a product, I, I think, of their visualness. How across the board do you think that, that music television has changed music and the look of music? Music television has made it more important to uh, to think visually all the time. Um, it was a lot uh, easier for us in some ways because we, we were playing live most of the time and we were influencing our audience uh, mainly by showing them the clothes in, in person. Uh, we did a lot of TV as well, which, which helped. Um, but we always thought visually, you know, which, which helped the band. It tended to overshadow the music sometimes, and I think probably that's what's happening now, is that the actual look and the video is actually overshadowing what it's about underneath, you know, the actual music side of things. Um, and it's getting so important to do a good video now that, uh, you know, I, I, sometimes I, I think I would have preferred to do it the hard way and play live everywhere rather than do try and get one good video. Yeah. I mean, probably work out as expensive. <laughs> how did, how, um, do you think it's tough for bands that are starting today? I mean, do you think they have the same opportunity to make the mistakes and to make the changes and to evolve as you guys did when you were starting out? I think the bands today have probably got um, a lot more opportunities in a way. They can actually achieve success by doing the right video, making the right record. Um, but it seems to be a short-lived success. Um, the bands that, that can actually play live and make it the hard way uh, usually last a lot longer. Um, if you get a band that, that gets a string of hit records in England and then they try and they go over and try and conquer America uh, to make the real money, which is live concerts. Um, and a lot of them come back nervous wrecks. They just really don't know what they're getting into. Yeah. It's, it's come so easy up to that point. Um, but unless you actually cross that barrier and, and make it in the States playing live concerts, then you don't really stand that much chance of lasting long enough to make a good living and a good amount of money. Do you think that uh, a lot of the bands that, that we're seeing today, John, do you, do you think that they are um, musicians or do you think that they're pop stars? A lot of the new bands are musicians, they're very good musicians, uh, but I think that with video it um, it gave a lot of people that couldn't play a, a really good chance of, of getting somewhere. Um, you know, there's a band like Six Six Sputnik can actually jump into the charts just by looking as they do, and, and a few well-chosen publicity pieces. Um, whether they'll be around in six months' time, I don't know. Uh, but it actually gave them the chance to do that, whereas uh, we, when we first started, you couldn't do anything unless you were good live, because there was no other facility to get through to an audience that was going to buy your records. today do you think is dressing creatively and putting on a good stage show? Banana Rama, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think probably Duran Duran are, 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 are doing things really creatively. But there's um, there's a lot of bands that, that, that are, are taking the other method of, of looking exactly like their audience, um, which I, I think is probably the, the easy way out. You know, I mean, even Six Six Sputnik, uh, at least they're trying to dress differently, you know, which is, I think, I think the better way of doing it is, is by dressing up, you know, trying to outdo your audience. Um, rather than actually become one of them. Um, 
Yeah, I think Duran Duran in their Gestapo period was about my favourite. You know, the sort of SS uniforms was was pretty neat for the time. What did you think about the whole punk era, the whole punk movement? Um, the punk era, I, I hid my head in the sand and hoped it'd go away. Uh, no, I didn't. I mean, I, I I found it difficult to to actually sort of go out to my favourite clubs and enjoy myself because I got surrounded by guys that came up and called me the granddad of punk and all that sort of business, which was making me feel extremely old. I think I felt older in the punk era than I do now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about now for a second. What What is happening now? Let's talk a little bit about the new album, if you don't mind. Uh, well, I'm down here forever. Uh, doing the new group album, which has no name yet, and nor is the group. Um, we've been doing it now for six months. Uh, we recorded it once and we started it again because we uh, realised we could do it better. Um, and that's it. I mean, the album comes out sometime in June. Will you be back out on the road? Uh, yeah, mid-June, probably <laughs> as soon as we can, really. Um, it depends. If there's a few uh, nice big festivals around, you know, Europe or England or America, then it'd be nice to actually introduce the band, at, you know, in front of a bigger audience. You know, we can't... I can't really go back to playing real tiny audiences because my, my equipment's too big now, you know. And what will you and the band be wearing? Uh, well, I can tell you what we're wearing now. Uh, they're all wearing my clothes because they run out because we're staying down here all the time. <laughs> no, uh, we haven't actually thought of a look yet. We've, we've got, a, got a bit of a problem with, uh, with the sizes of the band. Yeah, we can't all wear the same kind of thing because... Uh, Two of us are short and the other three are tall. And uh, we don't have to make the short ones look any shorter than they really are by wearing tall, skinny clothes. And they don't want to look shorter than they are by wearing fat clothes. So we've got to work that out yet. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.